Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 17th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what is driving the outlook for the PFD this session and beyond? Second, the University of Alaska still isn't understanding how big the fiscal challenge is ahead. Third, some suggest a carbon tax could actually help, not hurt, Alaska oil. And now, let's join Michael. Let's talk a little bit about uh, whatever doesn't kill you, make you stronger. We'll talk about the uh, PFD and this session and the higher spend and all these things, all these signs that you're seeing could mean that uh, we're in for a big shock uh, come this election cycle. Well, Michael, I, uh, there are two articles that if the, if the listeners haven't read them, I think are useful. One is an article that was uh, last week uh, in KTOO, which is the Juno um, uh, public radio uh, network, uh, entitled, After Years of Debating Major Proposals to Close Alaska's Budget Gap, the Session Starts uh, Slowly. And, and basically that article says that uh, there's really been no public debate about the PFD or, as importantly, other revenue options uh, in, uh, in, in the session thus far. But at the same time, you're seeing uh, uh, the House Finance subcommittees and the Senate Finance uh, uh, committees uh, that are where, where people are pushing forward uh, spending increases, particularly on the ferry system. I suspect we're going to see spending increases at the university, uh, or at least not the $25 million or $20 million in additional budget cuts that the governor negotiated with the university last year. Um, and I think you'll see some push forward uh, spending proposals in other in other areas as well. So you're you're seeing you're seeing no discussion of alternative revenue options, um, and you're seeing uh, a push toward um, uh, some increases in um, in spending from. From where the, the the governor's budget, the governor's already high budget, uh, uh, started us, and then yesterday there was an article, or, or late last night there was an article in, on the KTUU website, uh, the Anchorage television station, that uh, is a good dive into into what's going on with the PFD, and basically it quotes uh, uh, Senator or uh, Representative House Speaker Edgman and Senator Giesel as saying they're going to take the PFD cuts up in the second half uh, of the session. And that's, that's, a, that's a very clear signal that uh, I think that, that the PFD is going, to, is going to once again be used as the revenue mechanism to fill whatever budget gap, sort of the, the uh, leftover approach uh, that has been championed in the past uh, by former Senator Birch and Senator Von Imhoff, um, that the PFD is going to be uh, sitting there as the prime revenue uh, candidate for, uh, for for filling the budget gap. So I, it, it's a it's a very disappointing session in the sense from from those who who were looking for sort of a, an additional effort at cuts uh, over last year, um, and it's a very disappointing session thus far for for those like me who are looking for more equitable revenue sources. If we're not going to make these cuts, more equitable revenue sources uh, to to fill the to fill the gaps that that um, uh, the lack of cuts leave. Right. I mean, they, they don't seem to have any interest at all in talking about cutting the budget. And in fact, they don't seem to have any interest at all 
in um, in generating any more revenue than uh, the sources that are already on the table. I mean, the only two revenue sources that they've talked about uh, are these uh, small taxes, which generate like forty million bucks uh, out of a one point eight billion dollar deficit. That seems like a drop in the bucket. Uh, you know, you're talking about eighteen hundred million dollars, uh, and they want to they they've raising revenues for about forty million of it. Uh, and then you you know, of course, you've got the uh, this kind of idea that the only pot of money that's available now is the permanent fund, and that seems to be they they've got their eye on the prize, and they're not going to shy away from it. Yeah, I think I think I think the legislators at least are 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 locking in on that, and and that's going to play into the recall, right? I mean, the recall is essentially a a primary runoff between between Dunleavy and Kevin Meyer, um, and when when you view it how it, how it plays out, and Dunleavy has said, and I believe, and I think, and I think most believe that he will not sign a PFD bill; he will veto a PFD bill, that uh, a PFD restructuring bill that doesn't go to a vote of the people. Kevin Meyer will won't be able to get to the pen fast enough to sign. Um, such a bill, so uh, y- y- you can you can look at this and you can sort of see the play out that the legislature is not going to consider any other revenue options. The the two that that Click Bishop has up that you just mentioned are, are drops in the bucket. No other revenue measures are going to are going to show up. Um, they're not going to make the cuts. They're going to have they're going to sit there at the end and say, oh, well, we got to cut the PFD, and then there's going to be we're going to push into the recall. Some hope we're going to push into the recall. And if they if the recall takes Dunleavy out, um, you got Meyer there, and then they'll they'll make the the PFD cuts permanent uh, in some fashion, um, and that's that's the vision that you can see many many leaning toward or leading toward uh, as uh, as this session plays out. No cuts, and uh, in, in, in indeed some pushbacks. Use the PFD on a temporary basis. Have the recall, kick Dunleavy out, have Meyer sign a permanent bill, um, and problem solved. And and you know, uh, we just they just keep on going down the road. Horrible, horrible, horrible outcome for Alaska. The PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. Our 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 focus the focus the cuts on middle and lower income Alaska families, um, and 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 are hugely. Uh, inequitable uh, in that regard. Don't take anything from the non- from non-residents. Um, horrible outcome for Alaska, but for the top 20 percent, you got to remember this, Kevin Meyer was the senator from the top 20 percent for a long time. Uh, from the top 20 percent perspective, perfect. Uh, they, it just plays it right on out, uh, and they keep on going down the road. Brad Keithley is our guest. Alaskans for sustainable budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, this first one is, is the big one. Uh, what got me is kind of the disdain. It seems like a lot of our elected officials have, uh, in this article from KTUU, uh, at the end of the article, uh, is this little comment, which I found interesting, uh, in the background of those debates is the governor's pledge to have Alaskans vote on any change to the PFD before it's implemented. His veto power may prove critical in a, if a new way to calculate the dividend comes across his desk. Giesel said an advisory vote is not being considered by the Senate majority. The legislature is working on deliberations about a formula change. That's as far as we're going. She doesn't want the people to sound off. No, and 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 if they get if the, if the recall goes through, this recall is not about the grounds that, in my opinion, this recall is not about the grounds. Uh, that that are stated in the in the in the books that are going to go out. Um, uh, it is about uh, uh, the top twenty percent trying to get Dunleavy out of there and, and install their the senator from the top twenty percent as governor. Um, I mean, you look at the people Ed Rasmussen funding the recall, uh, Joe Usabelli funding the recall. Uh, you, you you look at the people behind the the money behind the recall, um, and it's the top twenty percent uh, who are using the cover. Of uh, oh my God, we can't cut the university. We can't cut K through. We can't do this. We can't cut. The, we can't do that. Using the cover of those things, but basically they see Meyer sitting there as their as their as their plant um, uh, to, to 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 get things right 
to not cut spending, keep government spending going, keep those construction contracts going, uh, but fund it on the backs of lower and middle income Alaska families. Uh, and they, you know, they've got this all lined up to, to go that way. So no, you're not, Giesel's not going to say that, uh, that she wants a, an advisory vote. I mean, if they get, if they get, uh, Meyer installed, they don't need an advisory vote. They're just going to keep it, keep it rolling. Um, and, you know, and rely on the fact that, that money, uh, will, will keep them elected, keep them in office and, um, and, and they'll end up, you know, down the road, half fat, happy. Uh, continuing government spending and, and, and not having to pay for it, uh, having shoved the cost off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Horrible, horrible, horrible well, outcome for the Alaska economy and Alaska families. Right. I mean, because Kevin Meyer is already on record. I mean, this is a guy that has not been in favor of the PFD. Uh, he is not a full PFD. I mean, he may have he may have kissed the ring and mouthed the words, uh, you know, as he joined the team uh, for the lieutenant governorship. But he. Uh, he, he's 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 no fan of a fully funded PFD. I, I haven't seen him kiss the ring or mouth the words. I've seen I've seen him just be quiet. I mean, it's this this is a this is a very interesting dynamic uh, that that's going on here. And and you and I and at least I, if, if we get into this recall, if the Supreme Court upholds the recall and they get the signatures, or even during the signature gathering phase, you, I'm going to talk about this as the Dunleavy Meyer. Uh, uh, primary, because that's exactly or the Dunleavy Meyer General or whatever whatever the right terminology is, because that's exactly what it's going to be. You're you're either you're either keeping uh, Mike Dunleavy and the PFD in office, or if you if you if you kick Mike Dunleavy out, you're electing Kevin Meyer, and there goes the PFD. I mean, right. it's it's, it's going to be that simple, and and everything you see in this session, everything I see in this session, is sort of lining up for that. Put the put the don't consider any other revenue sources. You know, let let Click have his fig leaf of you know these these pennies on the dollar tax measures, uh, but don't put any effort into trying to identify uh, other revenue measures. And Dunleavy, to some degree, is playing right into that by not proposing his own alternative revenue measures. But but don't consider any any alternative revenue measures. Keep the spending going. Don't stop spending. By God, uh, do a little pushback on on the university if you can. Um, uh, put the PF, put the revenue measures. How, how are you going to fund this off to the end? Make sure it has to be the PFD. If there's no other option on the table, then and then wait for the recall. And that's that's exactly what we're what we're doing right now. Those are the plays that are being played, and uh, I think you could see the handwriting right there on the wall. I'm just reading some of the comments in here. Meyer hates the PFD. Uh, the Alaska Marine Highway System is completely mismanaged. One percent of visitors arrive by ferry. Zero marketing. No contracts with the visitor industry. Zilch. Um, there is no more PFD, folks. It's normalized. That's what Harold says. Which I think is kind of what you're saying, Brad. Right? I mean, this is the new normal. The new normal is is they swoop in, they do what they're going to do, they give us the scraps and say, "Here, aren't you happy?" I mean, that's kind of what's going on. Yeah, and I think there's two things standing in the way of that. One is Dunleavy remaining in office. Um, if 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 there's a hope, uh, Dunleavy Dunleavy has to stay there. Uh, and then the second is uh, this fall's elections, and 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 reversing to some degree uh, what's going on uh, in the legislature, um, making a hard run at, at John Coghill uh, and others who are. Uh, uh, you know, sort of, the, sort of the keys to holding holding this uh, this uh, uh, PFD cut mentality that's in the legislature uh, together, re- reversing that and, and eliminating those. And those those are the, the those are the two critical things. The most critical is Dunleavy. I mean, if 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 we elect Kevin Meyer, which we would do by recalling Dunleavy, if if we uh, if we elect Kevin Meyer, game over, because because the the current. <laughs> In fact, the legislature may call itself back in. If we elect Meyer in the summer, you, I could see the legislature potentially calling itself back into session to get this done before the fall election. Um, but, but that's, I mean, that's where we're headed, and uh, and and those are the those are the key pieces. And it's becoming very, it's coming clear, becoming clear to me, uh, given what the legislature is doing this session, not considering alternative revenue measures. Uh, that uh, that that's exactly what that's the hand they're trying to play, which uh, again is uh, you know again very disturbing that this is a 
this is the this is the long game because again this takes out all the things that I think that you know that I, I mean, when I watch what the governor did I could say okay maybe he's playing the long game he wants to get all the way to the end he doesn't want to put up a whole lot of resistance during the session he already took all the heat that he did for that last go around so maybe he uses his veto pen at the end to make make a difference but if we don't get to the end then uh, then we've got you know we've got some issues do you do you think this gets uh, do you think this gets done before the final budget's there, or does he still have an opportunity, in your opinion, uh, to uh, to be able to veto some of these things ahead of time? Well, I, I think he has the. I mean, if they if they do a PFD restructuring during the regular session, I think he's still in office to certainly still in office to do that to veto that. But uh, here here's the problem. I mean, Dunleavy came in with a. I, I honestly don't know what game Dunleavy's playing. To tell you the truth, he came in with a fairly high budget and with no revenue options. Um, and the combination of those two is a se- it was essentially to leave it up to the legislature. Well, the legislature said, "Oh, that's fine. Thank you very much. We're just going to do the PFD cuts. Then we don't have to. We don't even have to think about revenue measures because you didn't propose any, and we don't even have to think about um, uh, budget cuts because you didn't propose any of those either." Um, so he sort of fed into this in the end of this process, in my opinion, um, and and it's setting it up for the legislature. Um, to do that, so I, um, I don't know, I, I, and I don't see Dunleavy at the end of this. I mean, if they do a PFD restructuring, yes, he'll veto that. But I don't see uh, at the end that he vetoes the budget back down to to low spending levels because he came in with a high budget. Um, so I'm not. I, 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 he has not set himself up for good messaging, and he certainly, if the if the re, if the recall is going forward. Given the way he's played it thus far, I don't expect a whole lot of huge budget cuts uh, at the end of this. After having come in with a high budget, I don't expect a whole lot of budget cuts coming in at the end of this uh, to, to bring spending down because he'll be facing the recall, and he and he he's indicated he's a, it appears that he's indicated he doesn't want to do that. So, I, I I'm not I'm not a big fan of the way the governor's played this, um, and and I think to some degree it's played into the Geisel. Uh, top twenty percent uh, approach on on how they want to play the end game, uh, but I do know this: if Kevin Myers elected governor, uh, it's game over. Uh, he, as, as I say, he will not he will not find the pen fast enough uh, uh, to, to to sign that bill. Uh, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for sustainable. Why does this feel like a Monday now? I just now I just want it really now. I really want to go back to bed now. I mean, this just gets worse and worse. And I think you're right. I hadn't really considered that that this is really more than anything else. This is a runoff between Myers and uh, Dunleavy. That's what this becomes. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they see that as a as a as a. That's what it's always been. Yeah, I think that, they, that's the, that's the way. That, that's the way Ed Rasmussen has always viewed it. That's the way Joe Usabelli has always viewed it. It's yeah. a way to, 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 to I mean, rewrite actually. the election. Continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. During the break here, I was just saying to Brad that I really hadn't considered this being the, like a runoff between uh, Dunleavy and Meyer. Uh, and Brad said, no, that this is the way that, uh, I mean, he's, you know, that a lot of the big recall supporters, I think, have seen this from the very beginning. You want to finish that thought, Brad? Well, I think I think the big money people, uh, uh, Ed Rasmussen, Joe Usabelli, the big money people that are behind, that are funding uh, this recall effort, have viewed it that way from the beginning. I mean, I think they, they viewed Dunleavy as sort of unreliable uh, on, on the issues that they cared about uh, as he dug in on the PFD. Um, uh, during the campaign, as he dug in on, on the PFD, as once he became governor, I think they viewed that as problematic. Uh, when he when he made the budget cuts um, uh, that affect you know some of their businesses, I think they viewed that as as reduced government spending on their businesses. I think they viewed that as some of the as 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 problematic, um, and I think they view Kevin Meyer as as a uh, as as a much more malleable. Uh, much more supportive um, uh, governor to to their interests. So, I, uh, yeah, to me, a lot of this recall effort it's been driven. I mean, I mean, yes, I, I, I have friends down in Cordova who have legitimate complaints about about the governor's budget cuts and others. But the but the push behind it, the money push behind it, 
I've always seen as a top 20% bush, uh, push to put Meyer in office. I, 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 I should be very careful about how, this, how I use this word, because I don't mean it in a, in a militaristic sense. But essentially what we've got going on here is a coup. Uh, a coup to 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 supplant Kevin Meyer uh, in place of Mike Dunleavy as governor, uh, with Kevin Meyer uh, uh, playing a historic role as the senator from the top twenty percent, uh, and put him in office to to uh, to, to be the governor from the top twenty percent, uh, a role that not even Sean Parnell played very well. Right. Kevin could play. Kevin would play uh, to the hilt. Um, and uh, and I and I just think I, that's how that that's where this is going. I mean, the fact that nobody in the legislature put up alternative. I I know people on this program don't want me to talk about alternative revenue measures, but that's the way we stop this. Um, and and the fact that nobody put in alternative revenue measures at the front end of this session, the fact that they're 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 gearing toward uh, PFD cuts, the fact that they want to have a PFD restructuring bill out there. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and set it up that way. I, it, it, everybody's, everybody on the top 20% cent side is playing the game the same way. Get to Meyer, get him to sign it. Right. Um, everybody on our side is playing, I, I don't know, different games. Uh, and we're not, we're not playing the right games, uh, to counter that because we're not coming up with alternative revenues or, 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 or sustaining the deep budget cuts necessary to get the state back into balance otherwise. It's like we showed up with our hockey pads on to the soccer field. It, it Really, at this point, that's kind of what it looks like. Um, the university is number two. They still aren't understanding the challenge ahead. I think that's pretty obvious with this opinion piece that's been written by uh, uh, the professor of history there at the university, Paul Dunscombe. Um, this, this piece, to me, is incredibly tone deaf. It is. I mean, so we're facing a billion eight, a billion, one billion eight hundred million dollar, or one billion eight hundred, yeah, eight hundred million dollar deficit, average annual deficit uh, over the next ten years, uh, with with no funding source inside in, in sight other than the PFD, and the PFD doesn't fill that for the full ten years, um, and 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 with no funding source in sight. Uh, and the university is still talking about, is still griping about the cuts, the minimal cuts uh, that they've that they've suffered thus far. They're, they're not understanding what's ahead uh, uh, for for the state and for them. Even if the PFD forces uh, the cut, the PFD cut forces win. Uh, even if uh, that just delays the inevitable for them. At the at the end of the day, the top twenty percent is going to say we're we're not going to pay no stinking taxes. We'll finally get around to cutting cutting government and the university is is sticking out like a sore thumb uh as as the big one uh that will be cut and the university is not getting ready for it i mean they're 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 sort of playing a rear guard action of of oh no you treated us badly we want some of our money back and to sort of buy them for the for the period necessary to get rid of dunleavy and to get and to get meyer installed to buy them I, the everybody will sort of play along with that but at some point, when we finally run through all the money anybody has ever had out there, um, uh, the university is going to be is going to be cut, and they're not getting ready for it. They're 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 fighting this rear guard action. They're 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 sticking to their you know three separate universities. They're sticking to their um, uh, we we can't suffer any more cuts. Oh my God, we might have to you know go to one basketball team instead of two. We might have to go to one hockey team instead of two. I mean they're 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 not realizing what's ahead of them. And and I and that's just going to make it all the more difficult and all the more painful and all the more disruptive. Uh, to deal with this issue when we when we finally get there one way or the other, if I were them, I would and I, I would be and if I were on the board, I would be dealing seriously with this issue now. I wouldn't be putting it off. I wouldn't be saying, "Yeah, we need to keep these three universities. Yeah, we need to keep these two basketball teams. Yeah, we need to keep these two." I wouldn't be I wouldn't be going down that road. I'd be saying, "How do we get to a single university that we can that that can be funded?" Uh, uh, well, within within a a more limited revenue overall revenue approach uh, for the state going forward. Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't seem like uh, Professor Dunscombe here has really taken a look at the long picture. It's always the short view. 
Uh, and I love how he talks about in the article, well, you know, this is the only thing, this, this, this is the only approach that matters because this is like means tested and it had students involved in it and everybody else was involved in it. But is anybody being shown the large picture, which is 18, you know, 18, a hundred million dollars in deficit for the foreseeable future moving forward. I mean, there's just no way to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to pick that up without, you know, basically huge amounts of taxes, uh, takings of the permanent fund and all these other things and, and no other ramifications. It's like all they could see is, is what's in their, you know, in their own sight picture right now. And they can't see beyond that. Yeah, exactly right. And that's where the board should come in. And where uh, and where you know the, the president of the university should come in, I, I I think Johnson, President Johnson, tried to get get them to going in that direction, but but he had a revolt uh, on the board. He had a revolt among the presidents of the of the individual uh, universities, the three individual universities, um, and really didn't have the backing uh, that he needed to be able to to go down this direction. I mean, it's not just Dunscombe, it's not just Paul. I mean, Kathy. Sandine, who's the president of UAA, had an opinion piece uh, this past week uh, in the ADN also uh, that talks about how important uh, UAA is, you know, separately UAA is. Everybody, everybody in the university system is thinking, you know, we're the most important thing. We're the thing that drives the state. We're the things that, that's necessary. So don't cut us. Uh, and in fact, you know, don't cut anybody. Just just cut the PFD. Just pay for it through through taxes on on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, and the the thing that has the largest adverse effect on the overall overall Alaska economy. It it. But but they're not seeing. You're right. They're not seeing the big picture. Johnson. I think Johnson did, uh, but he got overridden by the board. And I and I think we're just uh, we're, we're 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 you know the the, the Thelma and Louise vision. Uh, of of where the state's going generally certainly applies uh, to the university. They may have they may have won a short term engagement to sort of keep themselves alive for a while longer, but the cliff is coming. Uh, and if they if they don't get themselves ready for the cliff, uh, it's just we're just going to go over it and uh, and have a disaster. I, there's a there's a way to get ready for this to narrow down to one university to to get the cost uh, footprint uh, within something the state can stand on a on a long term ongoing basis, but uh, but they're not doing that right now. And and articles like this, and like and Kathy's uh, earlier, just just indicates that uh, uh, they're just not they're not they're not dealing with reality. They're dealing with this alternate universe where they get to go on forever. Well, and and like you said, I mean, uh, I think uh, I think Jim Johnson saw this to begin with. He was the one of the few that saw the long term consequences of what was going to happen. But as you said, he was overruled, and now he is being. I mean, again, that this this article kind of uh, you know downplays him and and you know his hasty, ill advised proposal, like you know he was just not up to the task kind of thing. Uh, whereas I agree with you, I think he was the only guy in the room that was, you know, not drinking the Kool Aid and saying, "Hey, look, there are big problems that are coming deep ahead. We've got to do something now." Uh, and I mean, he was there was talk about votes of no confidence and everything else. I mean, he's 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 in a very precarious situation. This is this is the price we pay. The state pays for having a weak board, for for having a board that was more that was more about. Uh, relationships and oh, we got to have one from this pot and one from that pot, and oh, he's my friend, and oh, he used to be in education, as opposed to a strong board that understands what they're doing uh, and and is 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 dealing with reality. This is the price Alaska pays uh, uh, for having having a weak uh, board of regents, and and you know, and the governor could control that too. The governor can. Can do replacements to the board of regents um, hasn't done it very well, uh, and and really hasn't positioned uh, the university to uh, to deal well with the with the future that uh, that they're headed toward. All right, Brad, you want to touch on this uh, number three, the carbon tax, real quick, and tell folks uh, what we're talking about here. I do. There there was an article uh, uh, this past week uh, in the ADN business section. Uh, by Elwood Bremer, uh, who's with the Alaska Journal of Commerce, uh, and the same article is also in the Alaska Journal of Commerce, so you can find it either place, that talked about a presentation made 
uh, on carbon taxes. And usually, I know, I know the listeners generally go, "Oh, carbon taxes, boo!" Uh, that's Keith Lee talking about taxes again. But but carbon taxes basically are a way, the Republican way, uh, of of dealing with climate change. They raise the cost of doing business on on high carbon uh, output uh, uh, sources. Uh, and and sort of try to capture some of the cost of carbon, force those those high output carbon uh, 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 sources to reduce their carbon footprint in order to reduce their uh, their taxes and their costs. It's a it's a way of incentivizing behavior by um, uh, by high 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 carbon emitting uh, emitting uh, sources. And one of the one of the industries that, that's that's traditionally been concerned about that is the oil industry because not only does it produce oil, which is a carbon emitter, but also in its operations uh, produces carbon. Uh, a group that promotes a Republican group that's promoting carbon taxes uh, made a presentation to Commonwealth North a couple of weeks ago that's captured in this article, and and really talked through an interesting aspect of this. Their point was. The Alaska North Slope is a low-carbon emitting production region. The reason for that is we don't permit flaring in Alaska, very limited amount of flaring in Alaska, flaring of natural gas, which is a high-carbon emitter. Um, and generally speaking, uh, there's good carbon operations, uh, carbon ca capture, car carbon uh, uh, restriction operations on the North Slope. And their point was, look, you guys are going to have a competitive advantage against other oil producing regions in the US particularly uh the fracking regions uh because of your because of your preferred carbon position fracking i mean if you go to permian in the west texas um uh they they are flaring gas all over the place huge amounts of gas historic levels of gas uh, to get rid of it uh, in connection with the production of the oil. There aren't enough pipelines to take it out of there, um, and, and the Texas Railroad Commission has permitted uh, flaring. So you've got a lot of carbon emission, and, and some of that's going on in the Bakken as well and elsewhere in the, in the, in the fracking regions. So you've got a huge amount of, of carbon production, carbon emission that's going on in those regions that would pay a penalty uh, as, a, as a result of, of a carbon tax. Um, Going forward, the name of the game in the oil industry is going to be about, is going to be about who's got the lowest cost, overall cost production. Uh, there's more oil than there is market, um, and so there's going to be a competition between oil production regions uh, over over cost. And and the group's point was Alaska has a competitive advantage. So don't have this knee jerk reaction about about carbon taxes uh, until you consider. What your relative position is uh, under the under the effects of the carbon tax regime that this particular group's talking about, it's not it's not a bad point. Um, and if you if you think through uh, other U.S. carbon uh, other U.S. oil production regions and the carbon emissions of those regions, they're right. Alaska has a, a significant relative advantage uh, to those other regions. Um, I mean, there's a question about whether we have carbon taxes in the first place. I think I think those who who are are viewing trends see that we're going to have some carbon restriction at some point in the next decade, um, and and carbon taxes are probably the best way to do that because they 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 trigger uh, the the capitalist system of finding the lowest cost solution to things. Um, so if you view that as 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 an approach to uh, resolving carbon uh, issues, uh, carbon emission issues. Uh, uh, their point was view our view our approach the, the carbon tax approach uh, in a new light by thinking about uh, the North Slope's relative position to the rest of the industry. A right. good point, uh, and, and one I think that's that's worth people digging into. All right. Well, it's food for thought. We'll have to take a look at it. Like you said, nobody likes the taxes, but if they if they are inevitable, at least maybe if there is a bright side to it, I guess you can try and find one there. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages and keep track of us during the week 
on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.